he's got number one. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've been enjoying the content since morning, uh, and you all feel smarter about AI. How was the caffeine break? Good? Awesome. With that, I would like to invite Fang Yuan, Vice President uh, at uh, Baidu Ventures. Please give, give it up for Fang Yuan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'm very excited also to introduce our next three amazing speakers for the AI and Finance panel. Uh, we have got, um, uh, let's see, we've got Yaz from JP Morgan first, who's a Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer. And afterwards, we've got Lee Den, who is the Chief AI Officer at Citadel. And then lastly, we've got Ashok Srivastana, who is the Chief Data Officer at Intuit. Uh, the first person up is going to be Yaz, and he is going to be talking to us about the pitfalls of AI applications in the area of trading. Uh, he has a, a very long history with this himself. He's been at JP Morgan for about 15 years and he now heads up their quantitative data group. So please give a hand up to, uh, to Yas, who's coming up. I don't think I need to. Um, so thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I'm, uh, it, it's an honor to be here. And I think it's, what's interesting is I usually actually talk about applications of uh, AI and finance to financial professionals. So this is an interesting, um, change for me where I'm actually talking to AI professionals about finance. So uh, I'm going to try not to use financial jargon. Um, uh, like was mentioned, the group I run, we run about, uh, we manage about $8 billion of long short hedge fund money, uh, purely quantitative. So uh, you know, quantitative investing has a long history. Clearly AI is a big part of that. So first of all, just generally, um, when we think about financial applications uh, of AI, clearly there are, the, the domain is huge, right? I mean, you can think of fraud detection is a big area of AI application, credit lending, determining whether uh, you know, the, the credit worthiness of, uh, uh, of customers. Um, more recently, robo-advisors. These are all fantastic and really interesting applications of AI, and they're all applications of AI that we do at JP Morgan. I'm going to focus on um, where AI is used in asset management, so where you're actually building um, investment models. So just because that's the area I'm focused on doesn't mean that um, the other areas are not interesting. They're just not my area of expertise, so I'm going to focus on the area that I know best and I think is the most interesting. Um, <clears throat> so going to quantitative investing, just to give you a, uh, a brief background, um, in terms of the timeline. So modern portfolio theory was first introduced in 1952. Um, and then, you know, since then, there is some element of quantitative techniques used by fund managers uh, generally, right? But really the growth started in the 1980s when you actually had the first hedge funds um, that used purely quantitative techniques to actually build models. And those were the CTAs. So the uh, CTAs refers to commodity trading advisors. The reason the word commodity is there is because they started, uh, um, in, you know, in the first instance, they traded commodity futures. These days, they trade all sorts of futures, commodity futures, fixed income futures, interest rate futures, equity futures, et cetera. But at their core, they are uh, trend-based models, so uh, momentum, reversal type models, um, and purely systematic. Then the 1990s, we saw the growth of equity-based hedge funds, equity long short, sorry, uh, um, equity-based quant hedge funds, because obviously equity-based hedge funds have been around for longer than that, but, um, but guys that were purely systematic like, like D.E. Shaw. Um, <clears throat> and you know, a, lot of the, a lot of techniques used in these hedge funds, um, I mean, uh, you know, broad statistical methods, econometric methods, and to a certain extent, AI methods cr uh, have, have been creeping in for a while. But then, um, more recently, they've taken another kind of, uh, another jolt, uh, a lot of interest just because of uh, the data explosion there. So just to give you a little bit more color there, the hedge fund universe is about $3.4 trillion, okay? Of that, the CTAs, the trend-following hedge funds, make up $370 billion. Th uh, these are exclusively quantitatively based. 
And often when people come into AI, they think uh, their, their first port of call is actually applying AI to CTAs. Why? Because they think, oh, pattern recognition, I'm going to do some trend following model, um, uh, and so this must be the obvious application of AI. And it's, it, you know, it is an interesting application, but um, and I'm going to go through in this presentation some of the pitfalls of time series based AI in finance and why that isn't actually the most interesting area of AI in finance, even though it's actually the default area that data scientists coming into, into the field think, that, uh, uh, think is the most interesting, because I guess it's the most obvious. When we think of the fundamental equity guys, the equity long short strategies, um, that I think is an area that is a lot more interesting than the basic kind of time series guys. When we think about what, uh, what hedge funds are doing there, they're basically using some kind of fundamental data. Uh, take a very simple model like an uh, like a valuation model. You're actually looking at, um, say, two companies, um, and you're looking at the company's earnings uh, versus its price um, relative to another company, earnings versus price. I mean, that's obviously a very simplistic model, but actually it's a model that works. Um, and, but you can do a lot better than that, right? Rather than looking at the company's announced earnings, you could actually try to build some predictive element of, of their earnings. You know, the, the, the um, simple example that, that people often give there is if you want to build a valuation metric for Walmart, look at uh, satellite images of their car parks and determine whether uh, you know, more people are shopping or not, or looking at, looking at credit card data. Um, uh, you can uh, tell whether more and more people are taking subscriptions to Netflix and therefore their earnings should actually uh, be going up and you'll know that before they actually announce their earnings. So, you know, so here we've started with a very simple premise of a fundamental model that's actually a valuation based model, but one that you can actually uh, augment <clears throat> and create a, a much better predictive version simply using new, new source of data. So before I go on, I just kind of want to... Um, uh, use this <clears throat> taxonomy a little bit just to highlight the fact that there is an element in AI and finance where people come into it and they're like they're data scientists they've got a hammer in their hand and everything looks like a nail and so it is very important and look uh, ultimately I had the same problem I mean uh, uh, 25 years ago uh, um, my PhD is also in AI come into this I didn't actually know traditional econometric methods as well and I think it's important for every uh, data scientist uh, coming into finance to ensure that they also understand traditional quantitative methods really well because ultimately you just want to use the right tool uh, for the problem at hand. And in some cases, you know, a lot of the interesting things have been happening in, uh, in, the, in the new source of, uh, in terms of uh, having new, um, uh, new source of data. And in some cases, you actually simply you could, uh, you could use traditional methods um, with a new source of data. So it's not even an AI problem, even though you're actually looking at uh, a new source of data. In some cases, you can actually use AI, obviously, in, in, uh, in, in traditional data, uh, apply, apply to traditional data sources. Now, when we think about the new source of data, uh, you know, we talked about satellite images. I mean, another a good example that uh, is uh, a model used in our emerging market equity team is one where they are looking at um, industrial sites around China, satellite images of industrial uh, sites around China and uh, inferring from that uh, industrial production data. So actually, um, to a certain extent, that is actually better than some of the data that the Chinese government puts out because um, some of that's of dubious quality. So actually, you can infer uh, better data by uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, images of the underlying um, uh, industrial sites. And, and there's a whole host of data. I mean, these are just a few examples. But what's important and actually amazing is that 90% of the data available to us in finance today has actually been collected in the last three years, two, two three years. Um, and so there's been an explosion of data. And that, you know, that's no different from any other domain. Um, but in finance, where historically we were more limited with data, I think this has actually really opened up uh, avenues for AI application in finance. So before I go into um, some applications that we've, uh, um, or some AI applications we've built, I just want to start with kind of three pitfalls of things that we need to actually bear in mind when we're actually coming into finance. The first one is actually related to the paucity of data. So um, these new source of data, we have an amazing cross-section, right? 
So it's great for an AI application. However, we're very poor in the time series. So here's a thought experiment. Imagine you have three years of out of sample data. So I'm actually being generous here. Three years of out of sample data, presumably your sample is longer, so um, given we just said 90% data is the last two years, I'm actually being generous. So three years of out of sample data, and let's say you build a medium frequency model. You trade once a month. That's actually, a, a significant number of models actually trade around that frequency. And let's say you have a success rate of 55% in predicting the stock market or whatever you're trying to predict. That's actually a pretty high um, success rate, or a, a, good, a, a good success rate. The probability that your model is random noise is 30%. So, um, and, and I think that just really highlights how important um, data history is uh, in order to get, I mean, you, you essentially don't have statistical power here. Even if you go into a weekly model, it's still not statistically significant. Your p-value is 0.12, right? Um, and so the, uh, uh, the lack of time series depth is actually one, um, one hindrance. Next one, I mean, this actually applies to all, uh, um, all modeling and financial data. I mean, um, it's not just a problem for AI techniques. It's also a problem for traditional econometric techniques. Financial data is non-stationary. I mean, you look at the graph in the middle, that's basically the um, um, daily returns of the S&P 500 in 2008. You look at the one on the right, that's non-farm payrolls. So clearly, very, very non-stationary. That's a problem. That's a problem for all quantitative methods. But one advantage traditional methods would have is you're actually um, imposing a functional form. So therefore, at least your assumptions are a lot more transparent. Uh, when you actually apply a neural network, and you, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, essentially guessing the functional form, you don't really know what assumptions you're actually, uh, um, um, you fit. And so that black box has actually been a hindrance to a certain extent in, uh, in applying some of these techniques. <clears throat> the next point is that, fairly obvious, um, you know, the model should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. And of course, you know, the great thing about AI is you have, uh, your degrees of freedom are much higher, but it also means that you need a lot more data. Um, of course, your in-sample data, uh, in-sample error will, will go down as the model complexity goes up, but, but your total model error will go up. Um, and that best model really depends on the application domain in finance. In some cases, it may actually be with more traditional econometric methods, and that should be fine. And that's why I think it's important that data scientists in finance is actually familiar with both um, um, AI techniques, but also econometric techniques. So I think, um, you know, with that in mind, I mean, th those are, I, I kind of focused on the issues around time series, but there are, there are a lot of other interesting air applications of AI that um, where actually the time series is not actually a problem. And so, um, and the reason I highlight these is because often people jump on this, oh, I'm going to go into time series modeling, I'm going to actually try to do some kind of momentum modeling or, or something like that, and, and that's where um, one has to be aware of these issues. Um, but when we actually look at uh, examples in, um, in, um, in, in building investment strategies, there are some really interesting things that, that you can build. Um, but the crucial thing is actually the domain knowledge is very important, right? Understanding what you're actually trying to solve for. So when we actually, you know, we talked about uh, building better valuation models. I mean, those are actually ones that you don't need that cross, uh, that, that, uh, the, the time series. The cross-sectional is actually important and because there's a very clean link between what you're actually trying to estimate and, um, uh, and actually a traditional model. So the traditional model is giving you the, the, the time series um, uh, confidence. So here's another example. So um, one of the strategies we run is an equity long short strategy, as I mentioned. We, we go long stocks that we like, we go short, we sell short stocks we don't like, right? And um, let's say, for simplicity, uh, we're, that our model is just a valuation model. We're going long stocks that have good earnings relative to price and short stocks that have bad earnings relative to price. Now, in that model, I, am, I don't really know or care what's happening with the individual stock. Um, and so I want to be diversified, right? I'm going to have uh, be long 700 stocks, short 700 stocks, um, and my initial universe from which I pick the stocks is about 6,000. Um, 
one source of stock-specific risk is, um, uh, is, our own, uh, is event risk, right? If there's a stock that um, suddenly becomes, there's a rumor that it might become a target, what happens to the stock? It jumps up, right? This is an example of a stock that essentially has just jumped up. And then if the rumor turns out to be true, it'll jump up again. If it turns out to be false, it'll jump down. So either way, this stock is jumping. It is not, it's exhibiting pure binary risk, and it's not exhibiting any um, risk related to what I'm actually measuring, uh, measuring it on, which is valuation. So what I need is some way to actually uh, look through all the stocks, uh, also all the news uh, articles, and, um, and determine the stocks that actually exhibit this problem and remove them from my universe. So I could do, um, I could hire a whole bunch of analysts, probably need as many analysts as there are in this room, to just sit there and basically uh, go through all these news articles and um, identify stocks that are subject to, uh, to this kind of event risk. Or we can build, I mean, in this case, it was an NLP algorithm that uh, essentially mining through uh, a whole load of uh, news articles and highlighting the stocks that are subject to, uh, uh, to this event risk and removes them out of our universe. Now, the interesting thing about this application is that actually um, I, uh, the false positives don't even impact you as much because actually if I removed a few extra stocks, it's not that big a deal. I've got 6,000 stocks in my initial universe. This typically removes about 500 stocks from my investable universe. If it removed, uh, and about 50 of them are probably false positives. So actually, it's still significant, but actually the impact on, uh, on my ability to generate um, the long short performance is actually uh, um, uh, negligible. And so in this case, this is an example of a stock that, for example, uh, oops, sorry, was highlighted uh, in about um, around the 29th of September, it came through uh, the news filter as, uh, as a stock that uh, there's a room, there's a potential rumor around it. Uh, we happen to be short this stock, and then um, it, you know, uh, early December it actually jumped up 75%. So had we had this in the portfolio, we would have actually lost 75% because we were betting the stock would go down. Um, so that's a really interesting um, example of how uh, we've used AI in a problem that actually none of those issues I highlighted actually impact this uh, uh, this application. Um, other examples, I, um, being told I'm running out of time, so uh, um, other examples that we've used, um, uh, AI earnings revisions, this is actually a really interesting one. So another interesting um, application for, um, or sorry, a model that is typically used by quantitative investors is um, looking at analyst, um, analysts when they revise their um, earnings estimates on companies, so they revise them up, and actually it takes a while for the stock to actually go up. They revise them down, it takes a while for the stock to go down. So actually you can actually trade on that. Um, but interestingly, you can um, uh, also predict whether analysts are going to actually revise their uh, estimates up or down based on the earnings reports. Now interestingly, the earnings reports themselves don't actually have any information because you can imagine there are like tons of lawyers at these companies making sure that the earnings report's very bland. But it's the Q&A that comes afterwards uh, that actually where, where the CEO, the CFO actually leak information. Um, and so that's what you can analyze and generate uh, uh, trading decisions on. Um, I talked about image recognition, so this is the, the satellite information. That's another very rich source of data for, uh, uh, we talked about industrial production in China. We talked about, you know, for example, um, um, uh, things like um, uh, using credit card, in, um, uh, sorry, yeah, using, uh, like for example, uh, looking at, I mean, there's this uh, footfall data for valuation you can use. There's um, car park information, you know, just basically around looking at whether people are actually visiting these stores, et cetera, to actually get information on, uh, on value. And then trading, I mean, I didn't actually talk about trading as much. I focused on generating the investment ideas, but clearly trading is, uh, is a huge application of, um, of AI as well because that's actually, you're going to the, into the higher frequency. Um, so hopefully that gives you a, a color um, on what we've been doing in AI in, uh, at JP Morgan. Um, and I think it's, it's a very rich area of, um, uh, of applications for enhanced um, you know, uh, 
creating better investment models. So I think it's a very interesting area for people to, to get into if they're interested in, um, um, in this stuff. So thank you very much. And um, I will pass you on to the next speaker. Great presentation. Um, next up, we have Lee Den, who is currently the chief AI officer at Citadel. Uh, prior to that, he helped fund the AI school at Microsoft and was also their uh, chief scientist of AI there. And then prior to that, he was in academia with a very illustrious career behind him. He is going to talk to us about the connections between models for speech and language and similarities to models for uh, financial investments. Thank you. Oh, can I need to, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, so the previous speaker spoke most of the things I want to say. So either we can start with Q&A or you want to listen to a little bit more about you know, some other areas of application that leads to um, our finance. So I actually would have something that overlap with the previous speaker. So if you feel bored, uh, you, know, you can sleep for a while. Um, so the main topic, uh, of my presentation here are as follows. First of all, I actually want to say a few words about uh, the AI impact uh, in various uh, industries, uh, including speech, computer vision, uh, NLP, robotics, et cetera. Uh, given that most of the people in the morning talk a lot about this, I'm probably gonna skip many of those. Uh, and then I will talk about some specific technical challenges um, that are unique to financial uh, you know, uh, investment industry in general. Uh, and that part overlap with the previous speaker. Um, and then I will talk about some additional constraints that uh, affect our, fa uh, our finance industry. Uh, and it's, very, uh, it's great that the previous speaker gave you enough background about hedge fund, you know, uh, asset management, so I'm not going to go through a lot of detail except to tell you some technical challenges that are kind of associated with some other kind of AI advances in speech, language, etc. cetera. Um, so what we can learn from successful AI application in other industries. So I will probably focus on speech a little bit. I'm gonna uh, go through a little bit quickly in this part. Um, and then I probably say a few words about AI's uh, interruption to NLP industry because that has a lot more relevance to financial industries obviously as you heard from previous presentation. Um, so uh, speech, nobody this morning talk about speech. Uh, since I work on speech, uh, I kind of, you know, sort of help, uh, you know, with the start of deep learning in speech um, in industry while I was at Microsoft. You know, actually I worked with Jeff Hinton about 10 years ago um, before he moved to Google. Uh, so I probably say a few words about this area uh, for those of you who actually would like to diversify your knowledge about AI success beyond um, image and speech, uh, image and uh, NLP. So, um, so let me go. Yeah. So, so as I showed you in the previous slides, uh, it's about you know a, uh, deep learning and AI started the speech uh, recognition uh, revolution about. 2009, about, that's about nine years ago, okay? And at that time, the success was very much in academic uh, sort of scope. Um, and then we worked really hard since then uh, within Microsoft well, before I moved to, uh, you know, to, to, to Citadel. Um, so about 2012, that was a big demo. That I think that's one of the early uh, media exposure of the deep learning success. That actually uh, turned out to be mostly on the speech. So, uh, that was October 2012. That was a big demo uh, by our company, you know, my previous company in China, Tianjin. It's about 3,000 people, a little bit more than uh, the, the audience over here. And, and he's our, uh, you know, head of research at Microsoft Executive. He actually gave this kind of really impressive demo using deep learning speech recognition out of the research at, uh, you know, using deep learning to actually do speech recognition. And everybody get really surprised at that time. Um, so this is the architecture uh, of the deep learning on voice recognition. There's a sequence 
uh, you know, properties of the speech that was actually handled by hidden Markov model at the top layer, layer whereas the lower layer of the uh, systems were built using um, fully connected neural network. Um, um, so I don't have much time to go over this, but I think uh, one very important part of the success over there is that we adopted this pre-training and fine-tuning methodology, which is pretty much like what well, the BERT, the uh, BERT system that you heard uh, earlier. Um, and it's kind of every five or 10 years, you know, things are coming back again. Um, and on the right-hand side of the diagram, it shows how error rate reduction uh, so if you look at, well, I don't know, you can see these years. The first uh, year is about 1994. The error rate for spontaneous speech recognition was almost 100%. Uh, actually, 100% isn't too bad, right? Because you think about voice, structure of prediction. When you insert word or delete word or something, they all count of error, right? So, you know, 100% error is kind of, you know, it's average of everything. So you can still get something right. And that was uh, about 25 years ago. So uh, after about, uh, you know, seven, f close to about 15, 20 years, uh, the progress, the initial progress is very fast as data get collected more and more using what's called the shared low machine learning based upon hidden Markov model. Uh, you didn't hear much about uh, today earlier. Um, but after you get more and more data, then the shared low model's capacity really gets saturated. The only thing we can do is to increase the number of Gaussian mixture model. We get about tens of thousands of Gaussians for the hidden Markov model. It just becomes crazy. So uh, there's no depth concept there. They're, therefore, it's very easy to subject to the overfitting if you don't do things well. And it's roughly about 10 years, uh, for 10 years, you know, the progress became very slow. And until 2009 and 10 over there, so deep learning got introduced to our speech community and the, the error rate dropped, you know, just one single year, more than about 30 to 40%. And then for the demo that I uh, show you in the previous slide, the error rate dropped down about 7%. It's just a dramatic improvement. And that was about 2012, so I worked for a couple more years over there. I decided, really decided that speech recognition problem is pretty much solved at the time. So I moved very quickly to natural language processing and some other business analytics. Uh, and they all show wonderful results. Um, so about two years ago, uh, I was approached by financial industry, not Citadel in particular. Uh, I was thinking that, well, you know, a lot of business in Microsoft, you know, they're, they're all struck by this technology, maybe doing something more challenging. So I didn't know much about finance at all. Um, I, and when I was sort of interview uh, at Citadel, you know, I, I even screwed up what's the buy side versus sell side. Right? This is a very fundamental concept. You know, I have no idea, you know, sell, you know, analytic report as well. So, but they say, don't worry about it. Uh, it the, the less you know about finance, the better it is. Because you don't have, you don't have to carry on the baggage coming here, you know, to do kind of, the, it's a very interesting. So actually, I carry on the same philosophy when I hire people in my team now in Seattle. So they are, um, so our company actually is, um, it's about three, $30 billion um, as under management. So we have, uh, it's a global company. We have uh, our offices in New York City. We have two buildings there. And then we have, uh, you know, our headquarters in Chicago. And they are, and also we have offices in San Francisco here, Hong Kong, uh, London, Shanghai as well. So about uh, last year, uh, when, they hired, when I got hired, uh, we established Seattle office. So I got a chance to hire a lot of people from high tech companies, from the, including Facebook, including Amazon, but not Microsoft, okay? So I'm very, very nice to Microsoft. Um, so anyway, so this is kind of brief uh, history of uh, speech recognition impacted by deep learning. Now, what's the lesson we learned? So let me quickly uh, skip some of those. Uh, so this is relevant here uh, because it has something to do with finance, okay? So if you look at voice recognition system that started about 30 some years ago, uh, you know, after the first wave of, uh, you know, AI sort of dies up, died out, and then the second generation of voice recognition came around, around based upon hidden shallow machine learning. It's a fairly sophisticated system, actually, uh, hidden micro model, how you actually, um, you know, uh, learn them in such a way that you can do really good uh, way. Um, so it actually, there are several block diagrams here. You have representation learning, which is based upon Fourier transform, and then 
uh, there is a Chamel frequency based upon human hearing system and you just fix them and then you do compression and then you do cosine, uh, inverse cosine transform so that you can get compressed. I mean, everything is really done. None of them were trained. It's all based upon human knowledge, you know, accumulated about 20, 30 years ago. So when I say that, I, it has something to do with the finance application here. And then there's an acoustic model, which is a typically based upon hidden Markov model with the observation distribution model, Gaussian matrix model, you have to have lots of them because uh, you don't have the depth. It's just, you know, very, very wide. Uh, and the, of course, the output of distribution uh, is actually, you know, whatever you know, we call them, uh, you know, so MMCC, whatever, you know, it, kind of the human uh, sort of engineer the features. And then there's a separate component, which is called lexical model, uh, which is simply just coming from the dictionary. And the third component, major component, is called language model, where you actually learn what are the sequence of words, probabilities, therefore you can provide the prior to help speech recognition to work well. So the whole point I want to make uh, out of this study is to show that it's not until about four years ago that every single component were trained, were learned separately. So you have uh, using acoustic data, you learn acoustic model, you have you know, language data uh, to learn language model, um, which is you know, what the bird now is doing, right, for natural language model. And then you put them together using some heuristic weighting between different components, you actually get the, the whole system. Um, and then the, uh, one of the major breakthrough of deep learning technologically is to integrate all these components together. Therefore, all systems components, which, because they are all represented by Hindemann, uh, sorry, they're all represented by deep neural network, including um, you know, some of the pre-trained model, fine-tuned model, all is done by neural network. Therefore, you can do end-to-end -end learning. Therefore, individual blocks over here, kind of the boundary disappear. And that's one of the very, very good lessons that we learned, how the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the whole system can be improved. Now, let's go to finance now. So this is the, the diagram that I took from one of the books that I was learning, I was reading. Uh, I got so many books in my office because I didn't know much about neuro. Uh, so I always start with something simple, okay? So these are the simple things that I, have, I, can, I, can, I can get. So the previous talk gave me much more depth over here. But in general, at a very, very high level, what's the finance, right? So finance has a few components. One is alpha model. You probably heard the previous talk mostly talking about alpha. Do you know what alpha model? Alpha model really is a very, very simple concept. You predict, you, actually you don't predict the stock uh, movement directly. You predict what you get out of those factors away, what's left over you predict. So the first time I read this one, I said, wow, you are predicting garbage, right? Um, and that's exactly what uh, <laughs> alpha model is about, right? So we have to do a lot of very, very hard machine learning to be able to predict garbage. So the nice thing about in finance, which I learned, uh, that's very different from uh, you know, my Microsoft previous work, you, s you know, look for 80%, 90%, you know, 95%, you heard earlier, 98%, 98%, it's crazy. I mean, here, if you get the 53%, 55%, you, pay, you can make lots of money. Right? So predicting garbage isn't as bad as you thought it would be. <laughs> uh, so that's the alpha model, that's all I want to say. Um, there, are, there are books, books talking about how alpha model is built. So I, I, it turned out I learned them all. <laughs> so that's my sort of concise summary of all the books I read. Uh, now the second part is the risk model, and that's kind of, uh, you know, you look, uh, you know, you get a factor model, you learn all these, these are all Nobel Prize winning stuff, right? So this, uh, uh, go to uh, University of Chicago, talking to all these experts. Actually, I, it turned out that I visit, uh, I actually gave a few talks at Booth School of Business, uh, business um, and also, uh, but anyway, so the risk model talks about that kind of, uh, you know, something that you know will impact uh, the stock movement. Uh, and, but if you do that only, then you get mutual fund, right? So, so your customer don't pay a lot to you, right? You know, 0, 3%, that's it. Now for hedge fund, you know, they pay, 20% or something like that. So you have to know something really good in order to, you know. Uh, uh, so if you just go, uh, you know, do all this mutual fund kind of investing, if much crash, you crash, right? Although luck, right? 
Uh, now for alpha model, if you do that well, you do long, long short. So if uh, market crash, it's good, you're happy, right? Because whatever you short compensate for whatever you know, long you lost. So it's just more robust, right? And the third component is um, transaction cost model, which normally you wouldn't appreciate. I didn't never appreciate uh, transaction cost model until I start doing some real work <laughs> you know, in the company. Uh, if you buy about maybe 1,000, 10,000, so probably it doesn't change the market much, right? but if you get about uh, you know, 100,000 shares or something you know, out of your big company, and then the minute you started buying, then stock price just changes, and then that will eat out some of the things that you originally, alpha model would predict. So that, that's a good area to, to look into, okay. And then of course there's one component which is the portfolio construction model that has a very comprehensive set of optimization which sort of, op, you know, so the problem here is really, really similar to, um, to what I call the uh, reinforced learning, right? So reinforced learning has a few components. Um, but anyway, so, and, uh, so the, I'm not going to say too much about this due to time con constraint. And there's an execution model that tells you how to execute them. But anyway, so this is, uh, you know, five components. So the reason why I compare this with the previous slides was to, uh, to tell you that when I went to the hedge fund company there, uh, every single company is done by different departments, okay? It's just like the previous uh, slides. So when I was at Microsoft, of course modeling, that's one department. Language model is different combined. Uh, now when deep learning come in together, they all merge, right? So, I, I'm, so anyway, so I'm not going to speculate on the implication of this um, for our financial industry. So uh, now I say a few words about natural language processing. So this is one of the, my last project uh, at Microsoft before I left. So I wrote a book uh, called Deep Learning for uh, Natural Language Processing. So I would, yeah, so this is actually a little bit survey of uh, all the chapters in the book. And I'll show you which component, which part of this topic may be relevant for financial industry. So the first uh, chapter, or the, the second chapter, what is the conversational language understanding? You probably heard some of the things uh, discussed about this morning that go skip over here. And this is the dialogue system. Dialogue is a really key component for many of these, you know, I, I think I talked about this topic two years ago at the same, t uh, the same conference over here. Uh, and then there are a lot of more development over there, so I, I just summarized all the things in the, this chapter. And also for robot um, uh, advisor, uh, now I think this technology is going to be relevant. So this uh, chapter talk about machine translation, uh, and this component, uh, chapter talk about uh, question answering. Uh, both of them have some uh, you know, relevance to finance, which I don't have time. And sentiment, and that's of course, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, things that you heard uh, in the previous talk about uh, natural language process, about news stuff, right? Uh, you heard uh, news filter stuff, and it has something to do with the uh, sentiment analysis and the image to text, uh, which probably less relevant. So I'll, I'll very quickly go through three um, challenges for um, unique to uh, investment management beyond what I have learned uh, at Microsoft um, earlier. So one is that the signal-to-noise ratio is unusually, unusually low compared to all the applications I had done before I joined uh, the hedge fund company. Uh, you know, the, the, the typical example is that you are just predicting garbage, right? So the output has a huge amount of noise, and input also has a huge amount of noise. Um, so when I was on voice recognition, we thought that, well, you know, you put the microphone in a very crowd, you know, very noisy area in the restaurant, and that has a lot of noise, you have to get rid of them. Uh, it, compared to what we are doing now, oh, that's a tiny, 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 okay? Uh, and not only input has more noise, but also output especially has more noise. Uh, that's, I think, all I want to say about this uh, topic. And the second challenge is the non narrative as you heard from the previous presentation. Now, for non stationarity it just says non stationarity it means nothing, okay? Everything is non including voice, right? So when I talk about the, uh, voice recognition, it's non the natural language is non, uh, is non stationary But non stationary has two different types. One is the one that we normally see yourself, uh, ourselves about the non stationarity like the signal that changes as functional time. So one of the things uh, that I was warned when I joined uh, the company uh, was that 
okay, Lee, you can build natural language processing system and voice recognition system today. More likely, next week, it's going to work well, right? Uh, but that's the kind of nuts naturally which is not going to affect the performance over time, whereas in finance, it's a completely different story. So that we call this type of nuts uh, as something having adversarial nature, okay? That means the competition, market, participants, they all watch what everybody is doing. Uh, you have to guess what other people are doing. Uh, that's one of the reasons hedge fund companies don't normally talk, give this, the talk like uh, I give now. Right? Um, but I do, um, because uh, the, all the equations are taken out here. <laughs> so it's a bit easier. Uh, so, so this is the example of the non uh in the signals that doesn't have any adversarial nature. So this morning, I, uh, I saw some of the diagrams very similar to this. Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, yeah, this is the voice signal. It has non -stationarity. Uh, but that doesn't have adversarial nature. You don't want, I mean, when you build the voice recognition system, you don't have somebody who is going to disrupt you, right? Just, well, unless, unless you are doing some, you know, uh, you know, military applications. But normally, for commercial applications, you don't have the kind of, whereas in finance, it's all over the places. So the third uh, challenge is what I call the heterogeneity of big data. And you heard previous presentation about alternative data. So not only you have natural language data, you also have image data you heard earlier, and also there's voice data as well. And I don't have time to show you why voice data would be useful for uh, finance. So that's a different topic. So this is my final slides. Uh, there are other additional other uh, constraints that are pertinent to um, you know, finance, you know, AI application to finance. And I'm, yeah, I don't have time to go through, except I mentioned the scarcity of talent is one of the very big challenge. So I, I probably interviewed, uh, maybe screened at least hundreds of candidates since I joined uh, Citadel. Uh, and very, very rarely we can find really good people who actually have both you know, talents. Right? One talent is you know, technology-wise, you need to be a hacker, you have to close your eyes to be able to code. You have to, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, this is a very important talent. You understand what, why neural network is the way it is. You have to understand why uh, this particular architecture can do certain things and not other things. And the other uh, sort of area that we're looking for is that it's not really, we don't, we don't really care about finance knowledge per se, but we need to have the people who actually have the sense of the finance, it's, you know, rather than the specific techniques. Uh, if so, yeah, we actually interview a lot of people who have no idea what has finance, and then of course, you know, we don't even interview, right? So, you know, the, 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 the essence of the finance, why is it so important? Why is it that competition can make things different? So how to get this kind of talent all together uh, is a big challenge for us. There's a scarcity of, uh, so, yes, yeah, so yesterday I got a chance to visit uh, Berkeley, so I talked to financial engineering people there around, I, I sort of trying to, you know, to not just to recruit them, but also to actually ex express the kind of educational needs for our, uh, our industry for the talents there, right? So we get a really good feedback there. Uh, and for that, of, uh, along that direction, so our company is doing all this data thong competition. I don't know how many of those. So two weeks ago, I just handed out $25,000 a, a check to a team in University of Washington uh, competition. Uh, and then, you know, the, 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 the top team will go together to New York, um, New York Stock Exchange over there, I think um, uh, next uh, spring. Uh, to compete with the Berkeley team, to compete with you know various, maybe about eight teams, the top teams locally, uh, and then we are going to hand out about one hundred thousand dollars just to identify all the good talent uh, in this direction. I think that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Lee, for your presentation. Um, the last presentation. Uh, in this panel set is going to be from Ashok Srivastava. He is currently the chief data officer at Intuit. Uh, before that, he, uh, well, he also is an prof adjunct professor at Stanford. Somehow he makes the time uh, in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And his speech is going to be about uh, applications of AI in uh, economic situations, specifically when it comes to consumers and small and medium-sized businesses. Thanks. Thank you so much. So it's a great honor for me to be here to talk to all of you about some topics that are extremely important uh, for consumers and for small businesses around, around the world. 
if you think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data, and you think about also what's happening in society today, what you can realize very quickly is that there's an opportunity to bring artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning into the realm of finance in order to help real people, normal people who are out there working on a daily basis to do better in their financial lives. This is a huge charter. It's a charter that many, many people are engaged in on a daily basis to figure out the best ways to use artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data in order to bring these things together to help people. Because fundamentally, if we have the opportunity to help people and if we can connect with them through personalized services, through recommendations, and also through giving expert knowledge delivered by a machine, we can change their lives. And if we can change their lives one by one, we have the opportunity to actually change the fabric of society. Because if you think about it, what really powers society is the small business. 99% of the firms in the United States are small businesses. They're not the large Fortune 500 firms. And because of that, we have an amazing opportunity ahead of us. I'd like to talk to you a bit, a bit about that and the way we're thinking about it in the context of Intuit. So as you might know, Intuit has many product lines. I've highlighted three here, TurboTax, QuickBooks, and Mint. These products have tremendous data associated with them of high granularity and also of tremendous consequence to the end consumer. This is really an embodiment of those people's financial lives, and we keep it very, very closely governed, very, very secure. But as we use algorithms in order to understand what's there, it gives us a unique ability to help people make better financial decisions. So we serve consumers, small businesses, and self-employed. And let me tell you a little bit about these domains because they're different than the domains that you heard about earlier today. I have worked in the capital markets before, and I find those areas extremely interesting and compelling. But this is also an extremely interesting and unique area to work in. So when you're working with consumer data at this scale, what you're facing are financial transactions that are coming directly from people, from their banks, and also that data is reflecting spending habits, connections, and also different aspects of the overall financial markets that are operating in the US or in other countries abroad if we're looking at the global play. So it's an extremely interesting data set. Small businesses. Small businesses are really the fabric of the US economy and I would argue for the world economy. This is where most of the people that are around us work, not in the big companies around us. And those small businesses are networks. They actually have ties to larger companies in some cases, smaller companies to consumers and so forth. So you can imagine a graph that is getting established through the use and understanding of small businesses. This is very interesting because that graph has specific properties that you can mine and understand, and you can actually use that information in order to make better decisions for other small businesses that might be around. Self-employed, so as you think about the self-employed economy where people are working on a daily basis for ride-hailing companies, for delivery services, and for other places, they have unique situations and unique challenges. They might be juggling two or three or four different jobs at once, trying to make ends meet, but also trying to make the best decisions with the cash that they have. If you're gonna make those people recommendations, if you're going to help them, you have to do it very dilig diligently and deliberately in order to make sure that they are getting the best advice possible. So our mission is to power prosperity around the world. This is a big and lofty mission because as you think about it, where we are today as a society, where we are with the software systems that we build and other people build, they're really not at the stage where we're powering prosperity. They're at the stage where we're helping people make certain decisions in certain localized fashion. But the scaffolding that it'll take to go from the current level to the top level of really powering prosperity, in my opinion, is going to happen with artificial intelligence machine learning, and certainly with the use of data. So let's get into it a little bit. As you look at what's happening in society today, people in small businesses are struggling 
with the complexity of financial transactions. Now, many of you have advanced degrees. Many of you work in places where people are very well educated. How many of you have actually taken a class on how to do good financial management? Maybe our friends from JP Morgan have done that. Maybe our friends from other pl places have done that. But as you think about the whole world, have people really gotten that education? Chances are the answer is no. And in that lies a tremendous opportunity for us. So the complexity of those transactions can't be underestimated. For instance, if you think about a small business and their cash flow demands, so for instance, that company says, I need to make payroll this Friday. Payroll outlay is $100,000. I've got $80,000 in the bank. How am I going to make that transaction? That's something that people face on a daily basis. And so if we have the ability to look across all the data sets and make better transaction advice for them, we're going to be able to help a lot of people. So look at some of the statistics here. Debts are increasing. A 45-year-old person today has the same amount of student loan debt as a 27-year-old had in 2004. Think about the implications for that person today. People aren't saving, so 44% cannot come up with $400 for an emergency. Some of you probably have $400 in your back pocket right now in cash. Think about all of those people out there that don't have it, and think about the ways that we can influence those people and help people make better financial decisions. Half of all small businesses go out of business in the first five years. Half of them. Think about the opportunity that's ahead of us. So how are we thinking about it at Intuit? First, the data. I already gave you a little bit of idea about the data, but let's get into it a little bit more. The richness of this data set can't be underestimated because we're seeing how businesses operate, small businesses operate, how consumers operate, and also how the interaction between those two things occur. This is very unique because it gives us a constellation, it gives us an image of what's happening on a daily basis across these various areas. But in order to really understand that, you have to represent the information correctly. If you do it just in tabular form, quote unquote, rows and columns where the rows are uh, units or people or small businesses and columns are features, you actually lack the ability to show the network effect. And so we want to represent the data as a network because that's naturally how it stands. And that representation is extremely powerful because now you can analyze that network and understand connections, make recommendations for connections, and also understand the way information is flowing through that network. This is a very deep uh, machine learning problem. And I don't mean, by the way, a deep learning problem necessarily, but a deep machine learning problem. Because as we look at that financial data, and as we see the data and the transactions flowing, we can garner new information that can help make better insights into the situation. Certainly, machine learning plays a key role here. And it need not be just one class of machine learning algorithms. For instance, not just deep learning. Certainly deep learning has solved tremendous challenges. And as we heard the past two speakers speak about it, we've seen it work in NLP in many other areas, in image understanding many areas. But the fact is that there are many other areas and many other aspects of machine learning that need to be exploited in order to really achieve the, the goals that we have. And finally, natural language processing. So the ability to extract semantic intent out of data is very critical here. And the ways that we do that and the problems that we uh, uh, work on are really quite interesting. As I came into this company and started to see it, I was very excited about it. I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. So we think about things here in terms of proactively managing financial risk. And so risk management is something that the big banks do. Many, many uh, uh, hedge funds, many, many in institutions do risk management. But what does risk management mean if you're a self-employed person who has $200 and a f in the bank and a $400 insurance payment to make? Risk management means something very different to that person, and it's very, very personal. It's a very different world for that person. And so in that context, measuring things like what causes failure in these areas is very important. And as I was preparing this talk, I looked 
out in the industry, and I said, what are some of the common causes for small business failure? I'm not going to read them all to you, but there are about 10 up there. Look at what's at the top of the list. Lack of experience, lack of sales, competition, et cetera, insufficient capital. These are some of the things that bring half of those businesses to their demise after a few years. Now, how do you address it? Well, there's this flywheel on the right-hand side, and some of you might have seen previous talks that I've given. I often talk about this flywheel, and I know that I've talked about this flywheel in many different contexts. I've worked in the aerospace industry, I've worked in finance, telecommunications, advertising, many places, and yet, you'll notice that this rubric, this set of topics of anomaly detection, diagnostics, prediction, and taking actions comes up again and again. Why is it? Well, it's not because I'm a one-trick pony. It's because this is an, a, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of isolating problems into certain domains that you can attack using machine learning. And as you build it into a cascade, you find that it creates actually a flywheel effect that can help you understand and actually modify behavior over time. So let's get into that a little bit. So the first thing, looking at, as, as you're building something like this, looking at the internal data sources you have. I've given you some insight into the type of data that we have. But now also bringing in external data sources becomes critical in this process because no matter who you are, no matter what type of data you have, chances are there's somebody out there who has data that you need. And so through partnership, through acquisition, through other types of mechanisms, you need to build that data bridge so that you can pull the data into some sort of a platform. Here I've indicated that platform could be centralized, but the fact is, generally speaking, these are distributed platforms. And those distributed platforms need not be distributed, I don't mean like distributed across a cloud environment. I mean actually that I might have some data and that you might have some data and that we actually can't share that data or for whatever reason bring it together and so we need to analyze it and work with it separately. That's a critical issue in many of the applications that we face and frankly in many applications that other companies face as well. In those types of environments, it turns out that convex methods, methods that we hear about in other domains, have tremendous application. ADMM, for instance, alternating direction method of multipliers, it's a whole framework for doing convex optimization in which you don't actually have to share and centralize data. This is a remarkable technology, a remarkable capability that was built in the 70s, popularized in the last few years by uh, colleagues at Stanford who are really thinking about how to do data analysis and machine learning on a distributed platform like that. Regardless though, this information needs to feed that flywheel. And that's where you'll find that deep learning and NLP and many of the other technologies that we've been discussing today and elsewhere comes into play. As those things are built, we always need to think about the endpoints. And in fact, the way we do things is we start at the endpoint and we work our way back. Oftentimes, companies start at the left-hand side and work their way forward, but we actually do it the other way. And the reason that we do it uh, the other way is because of the way I started off this talk, because we're solving things for end consumers, for small businesses that do not have the capital, that don't have the ability to manage risk the way others can manage risk. And because of that, because of that deep customer empathy, we focus there at the end point and then we work our way back. And so if you think about an endpoint, for instance, an embedded endpoint, that might be something that's actually operating in QuickBooks or in TurboTax or something like that. At that endpoint, we need to say, what does this person need in order to make the best financial decision that they can and work their way back? And we do that through data, through actually large-scale data analysis, but we also do it through what we quaintly call follow me homes. We literally go and meet with consumers in their environment, we meet with small businesses in their environment and we see how they do things and we interview them. This might seem like an old fashioned thing to do at an AI conference, but frankly there's nothing like talking with people in order to get data. The fact is that your sensors that you are given are much better than the sensors that you can get through the placement of of uh, data systems. So we, this is the way we think about it, and as we do that, we're always thinking about how to create the user experience so that people are 
delighted when they use the software because the fact is most of us don't look forward to doing our taxes around April 15th. None of us actually probably do that. But what we're excited about at Intuit is making that process as seamless as possible. So we divide our work into three categories. And in fact, all of the work that we do within my organization can be tied to one of these three areas. First, enabling people to have more money in their pocket through the use of the software. So tangibly showing that through the use of machine learning, through the use of data, or whatever interface that we are putting in front of the pe person, they're able to make more money. Second, that the effort is less, because the fact is that entering data in order to do taxes or bookkeeping or whatnot is difficult. It's tedious. It's time consuming. So we measure ourselves on the ability to drive down the amount of effort that people spend. Driving complete confidence, because a lot of people, when they're doing their taxes or something like that, they're concerned, did I do it right or not? And so we need to have AI systems that instill that confidence in people so that they know they've done the right thing. So let me give you some examples here. Automating financial tra uh, tracking in multiple products. So about 13 million QuickBooks and Mint customers can automatically categorize about 250 billion transactions per year with high degree of accuracy. Now, these numbers, they might seem big to you, they might seem small to you. It really depends on where you come from. I've, uh, in, in previous places, worked in situations where we had 80 billion transactions in a day. There are some of you that might have even more than that. The key point here is, though, as we analyze that data and we surface it, you can see the way we surface it, it actually leads to real savings for people. So, for instance, average user finds about $4,600 in tax savings using QuickBooks self-employed. So let's think about that again in a context where some uh, people, some of the consumers may only have, may not have $400 in order to make that insurance payment or fix a flat tire or fix their transmission. Here we're saving $4,600 on average. What that means, obviously, is some of these numbers might be much larger than that. Um, no work. About, we're estimating about 70 million hours per year of tedious work saved using these algorithms and driving complete confidence because of the higher accuracy through these things. QuickBooks Capital. So this is another thing that's AI powered that we're uh, building within my organization. So here the idea is that small businesses often need to make quick loans, get loans in order to make payroll or make, buy inventory, work with suppliers, things like that. And what happens if they don't have that ability? They go out of business. We are giving them the ability to make, get small uh, short-term loans through a simple interface powered by AI that can help them actually bridge the gap. And this is very exciting. This is one of the biggest areas of investment that we're having right now. So let me give you some idea about some other AI topics that we're pursuing. Knowledge engineering. So how many people, how many talks here, or how many conferences uh, such as KDD talk about knowledge engineering today? Not too many. But the fact is that we have a lot of knowledge, and that knowledge is encoded in rules, and those rules need to be transmitted through an artificial intelligence system to the end consumer. Think about the US taxes, 80,000, literally 80,000 pages of rules. We're building systems that can ingest those 80,000 pages in natural language, understand them, and then write computer code so that the taxes can be filed, and so that you, for instance, don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to read those 80,000 pages. That's a daunting task. That's what we call knowledge engineering. But you can't just do that by itself. Machine learning plays a very critical role here, because in machine learning, you have the ability to take data, synthesize it, and then use it to make predictions married with that knowledge engineering capability. And then you need to have a reasoning capability on top of all of this to make sure that the right decisions are getting made. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we'll have a panel discussion now.
Well, thank you guys for um, all really interesting, wonderful presentations here. Um, let me also introduce myself quickly. Um, my name is Feng, and I work as VP Investments at Baidu Ventures. We are the non-strategic investment arm for Baidu. And I'm part of a team that's based out of San Francisco. We cover all the early stage deals in AI and robotics uh, that are enterprise facing outside of Asia. So we've done about 30 some, mostly North America, since we got launched about almost two years ago. And actually one of my portfolio founders, Peter Bio, is gonna actually speak at this conference tomorrow morning. So this is definitely a topic of interest for us as well. Um, my personal background, I was a financial services consultant for four years before I moved to San Francisco. So this is also like an area that's of personal interest um, as well as professional interest. Um, my original questions to the panelists had really been more specific to each of your individual presentations, but you know, feel free to jump in on each other's uh, thoughts as well, because I'm sure there's a lot of overlap uh, in terms of uh, uh, areas of interest. So uh, just kind of going in order of the presentations uh, for Yas and a little bit for Leah as well. Um, obviously, hedge funds in general have been using AI to complement quantitative trading strategies for, for many years now, and it seems like even more hedge funds are sort of jumping onto the bandwagon. Uh, it really seems like AI is a type of alpha these days, and if so, how, how do sort of uh, hedge fund teams or quant teams maintain that edge over time? Because you know, other people might start using uh, information that you have access to. Uh, what are strategies that you and your teams use to make sure you maintain that constant edge over time? Is it just changing strategies, getting new data sources all the time, or how does that work? So, I mean, it's an interesting question. Obviously. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one thing I thought was interesting is, is actually your use of the word AI as alpha because I think um, I think that's dangerous because ultimately we need to think of AI as uh, part of the suite of algorithms we have um, and so um, <clears throat> I mean you uh, AI could be a negative alpha if used incorrectly right so I think the, the crucial point is actually um, is you have um, the right talent uh, you know, um, in, in terms of those who actually understand the AI, um, have, the good, have, have the right financial domain knowledge. I actually disagree with one thing you said when you said actually it's best to come into, uh, into finance with, without any domain knowledge. I accept that you come with an interesting perspective, a different perspective, but actually that domain knowledge is absolutely crucial. Um, and I mean, it starts with recruitment. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you build out uh, the right team. We're, we're building out our AI team. Um, um, we're, we're actually hiring the Bay Area as well, so we, you know, we're, really, we're really expanding there. But I think um, uh, it's also um, the sources of data. And you know, we talked about the fact that source of data are actually limited uh, when we look at the time series. Mm -hmm. But actually, and this is also why domain expertise is, is, is important, because in some cases, you may not have the statistical time series power, but actually, if you actually, um, um, if, if you understand the economic linkages, you may actually uh, be willing to actually use the model. You have the cross-sectional depth, no time series depth, but you still may be willing to use the model. Mm -hmm. Because actually, once you actually have the time series depth, that's when the, the information may have actually been arbitra arbitraged out. Yeah. I don't know if you... Yeah, I agree with you now. I mean, what I said earlier, reflected my understanding about finance about one year ago. Right? <laughs> so over one year, I slowly appreciate more and more about what you said. So I, I do fully agree with everything you said on your slide. Interesting. Um, and do you find that there is, um, <coughs> in terms of actually finding talent, which is what both of you guys have touched upon as well, how do you find these people that have both the technical knowledge as well as the financial services knowledge? Is it kind of like you bring really smart people to the firm, you train them up on the financial knowledge? Or where do you find these sort of unicorns of, of hires out there? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think to a certain extent, um, um, the uh, uh, you, you absolutely. I mean, we, we do actually hire a lot of people um, um, who are domain experts in AI, and then they develop the financial knowledge through uh, through the work at JP Morgan, um, uh, through working with the investment teams. I mean, in, in, um, obviously, my team is an investment team. We also have an AI team. We work very closely together. So. Um, and there's also a lot of unique data sets we have that uh, through access to that they actually develop mm. uh, that knowledge. So I think a lot of it is actually um, when we're looking to hire, we're looking to hire often AI domain experts and, and they, they would develop their, um, uh, their financial expertise through, through JP Morgan. That makes sense. And Lee, on, the, on your entire presentation, all the different hurdles that you mentioned as well as the other you know, four additional, additional constraints towards yep. the end. How is sort of Citadel, or you know, if you see other companies as well, facing these sort of hurdles and either overcoming them or not overcoming them, and, and why is that the case? And yeah. you yourself in your, in your role as well, how do you sort of advance uh, you know, um, going yeah. away from these obstacles? 
Yeah, so we work on all these areas. Um, so of course, we won't be able to share any specific techniques, but on the other hand, um, all these areas are important. And they are quite imminent, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, especially the third part, right? I mentioned about alternative data, um, and that's actually kind of new, kind, new type of alpha uh, probably should come from there because for time series analysis, everybody uses it, right? So mm -hmm. I think if you don't use it, you lose, right? If you use it, you are not losing, but yeah. you may not be able to gain as much, right? I don't know, you probably agree with me. <laughs> you know, alpha, it's due to competition, right? You know, all the things that are eating up. So alternative data is probably the most important asset Interesting. that uh, AI can make a big impact. Okay. So we obviously, you know, I think everybody needs that you heard. Uh, actually, one of the slides that I have, uh, I probably didn't, I didn't have time to ex explore in detail, actually come from JP Morgan's report. <laughs> uh, that has about 230 sources of alternative data. So I read every one of them. <laughs> 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 that happened last summer, or oh, not last summer, uh, about one and a half years ago when I joined uh, Citadel. So when I started building the team, you know, while interviewing people, you know, of course I want to learn more about what's right. going on, and that's the very first piece of information that I got. That's great. <laughs> um, and Ashok, you kind of have uh, not that problem because you're sitting on so much data, in fact. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually kind of curious from a product perspective, how do you sort of structure your teams to make a product that has uh, obviously AI built into it, but also that's really consumer friendly? Uh, do you kind of structure your team such as, you know, you have a group of AI, uh, AI researchers, data scientists sitting underneath you, and you guys uh, work in terms of project styles and different product teams around the company, or it's kind of like these, uh, these AI folks are sort of embedded into different parts of the organization. What have you guys found to work really well for building uh, AI-centric products that are also uh, consumer-centric as well? Yeah, that's a great question because that's necessary if you're going to work on consumer-facing products. So we've defined our teams as follows. There's the traditional product development leader. There's the product manager. He or she is kind of the domain expert. There's the experience designer. So that person is thinking about that end person's experience. What does he or she want to see and why do they want to see it? And then the fourth one that we call this a tetrad, the fourth one is the data scientist because he or she is going to be the one that bridges the gap from the data and from the domain of AI into this world because the fact is that the first three don't necessarily have that experience. And what we're seeing is that if you can bring these four groups together in a room, they come up with magical solutions. Then what you start to see is they're thinking about it from the consumer standpoint because that's critical in our applications, but they're also bringing in the deep domain knowledge about deep learning or whatever capability we, we have to build, and then it all gets stitched together. The data science teams then can work back into the platform and say, we need this new platform capability and then get that platform capability built through a microservice that then drives the end consumer's application. So that's the way we think about it. It actually works very well. My organization has uh, spread across all of the business units within the company as well as all of the functional groups. So we do the same thing for internal purposes, for HR, for finance, for other parts of the internal organization of the company as well. That makes a lot of sense. Um, of all the different sort of AI solutions that you've built so far for your customers, which one has seemed to have the biggest ROI for the end customers? Are you able to give some specific examples of which ones have had the biggest impact? Yeah, I, I touched on two of them. Um, and or three, maybe. Um, so, uh, Big impasse right there. <laughs> no, you're fault. So I touched on two of them already. So one of them is in this area of categorizing uh, transactions. So if you think about it, it's, it's perhaps an easy problem to solve. Um, so if, if you think about it, what we're working on is about 250 billion transactions. They have to go into multiple categories, let's say 70 to 100 categories. As that happens, we need to make sure that the sound system works. Yeah. Can we have, can we have also, a sound? I think you're all, you probably a little battery or something.
Should I have kept this on? Yeah, you should kept this on. It'll just share between the two. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, categorizing financial transactions into about forty-six hundred dollars in um, returns for right an end consumer. That's this one example. Another example is, frankly, codifying the U.S. tax base and putting it into a machine that generates knowledge and that also generates insights for people. That's a huge, huge win. So some of you might use TurboTax here, and what you're going to see is that a lot of the recommendations that are coming in TurboTax are directly coming from AI-powered solutions. So it's all over the place. And the beauty of it is that it's seamless. It doesn't like pop up on your screen and say, look, you're using machine learning. Uh, that was from the past. This is something that's in situ in the product, and you never know that it, you're using it. That's, I think, the standard that we're trying to work for. Yeah. Um, sadly, we're out of time. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to uh, give us your presentations. And uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.